Prepare yourself for Earthling Entertainment with your hosts, Joe and Ryan. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Earthling Entertainment with Joe Wakefield and Ryan Lang. Hey, I'm Joe Wakefield. And hello, I'm Ryan Lang. Yeah, guys, so for those of you joining us again, welcome. For those of you joining us for the first time, what we do here is a little bit of the spooky, a little bit of the creepy. Sometimes we do cryptozoology. Other times we do ghosts, hauntings, curses, myths, legends, lore. But it's always creepy. Then it's followed by a segment called Disclosure Discussion. That one's all about aliens. I'm just asking questions. What has the government released? What's being asked of them? New videos, new stories of sightings, UFO, UAP, whatever you want to call it. Today, we actually do have a new sighting. Excellent. Then the latter half of the show is dedicated to the entertainment industry, whether it's music, movies, video games, who knows, books even. It's all entertainment. Occasionally, we do Trivia games. We do what, what? What would you say? Headlines. You would say celebrity deaths. Uh, you know what? We even have interviews in there, and it's always entertainment. And those two things together, those two sections of the show, are spooky and are pop culture come together in a loving Oreo we like to call Earthling Entertainment. Welcome. Dip it in milk. <laughs> hey guys. So. Little recommendation out there. If you're a fan of the show, I think you'd really like the film The Watchers. It is a new film by M. Night Shyamalan's daughter. I believe her name's Aisha. Aisha Night Shyamalan, I believe. And uh, it's very good. It's based on a novel, and it's starring Dakota Fanning. And I don't want to give anything away, but it's um, they they stick the landing, in my opinion, when it comes to not being as obvious as uh as a thing it's it's not so much a twist at the end as it is a reveal and i re- highly recommend it have you seen anything new lately ryan uh you just showed me the trailer for that one and that does look interesting anything that i've seen that's new i honestly can't even put my finger on i've been jumping back into game of thrones for one reason or another fair enough i've just been trying to <laughs> i'm a movie guy so i've been trying to go to the theater and see any new movie that i really liked another film that it, you know our listeners would probably enjoy a quiet place day one i saw that in theaters i, I saw just that watch my part mom two. <laughs> i just watched part two really because so, they're streaming it to promote the new one sure 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 you know uh the african-american gentleman who is running the island in part two yes Yes, he is in uh, day one. Really? So yeah. he it's like a prequel? Uh, day one, well, it's called day one, Ryan. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> yes, it is a prequel, <laughs> and it is starring Joseph Quinn, who plays Eddie Munson in Stranger Things Season 4, and Napito Nawanga, I, I apologize if I got her name wrong, and she played uh, Maz Kanata in the Star Wars films. Oh, all right, well. Sounds good. I mean, I want to see it because, like I said, I just, I liked the first one, and I watched the second one, and I really enjoyed it. I thought they killed it. That was a great movie. Well, this, if you liked it, you'll like this one because it is more of the same. And I mean that in a good way. Like, if you get more encounters with the aliens, you get more encounters of survival, you get to meet new characters. The only issue that I would say is they don't add anything to the lore. Like, I kind of feels like... If they're going to add something to the lore, they were waiting to do it in A Quiet Place Part part 3. You know, we couldn't do it in this prequel. No, no, no. Because it was just more of the same. Like, it is day one. You know, you're in New York. The aliens arrive. When it happened. When it happened. uh, And then you have your characters, and they survive through the movie. I don't consider this spoilers, because this is obvious from the trailer. They do their thing. And there's a, you know, an end goal and they, you know, meet it or they don't. But the point is, it's a alien survival, just like the other two. I have to say, sometimes I like it when a movie doesn't have to make something complicated and like, oh, this came from this or whatever. Sometimes it's just like, this is what we're dealing with. Like, well, I yeah, kinda like that. Well, just like in the uh, the first scene in the second film when they come in through meteors. Yeah. Yeah. So they do that again, right? I assume. 
Well, no, they do in this one. I'm telling you. So what I'm wondering is, is like maybe the story is they're just kind of space locusts. That's kind of where my brain went. Is this thing crashed and look at that? They crawled off of it and now we're all in a lot of trouble. Well, I'm you know I think each thing is them. I think they're they're like a swarm of things that fly through space and land on planets, eat them alive, and then somehow maybe their actions will blow up Earth and then they will be relaunched into space to find a new yep. planet. Yep. All I've seen of the new one is this montage that's now become like a funny. Like, Gonna need a montage. This the, the meme is like a video of this guy running from the aliens holding his cat, and the, the song oh is God. like, "I need a hero, <laughs> I need a hero to the end of the night." Right, like, right. so as he's running and jumping off the dock, like that's all I've seen of it. I gotta be honest, guys. I'm gonna. One small spoiler. So, you know, if you want to see A Quiet Place Day One, you don't want any spoilers at all. Literally fast forward like a minute because this is going to be real quick. All right. So ready? Go. (laughs) That fucking cat lives through the movie and it gets through so much ridiculous stuff. It's almost like a joke where every scene that cat is in tremendous danger and in an impossible situation and it lives through the whole fucking movie just in the background looking at its paw like what kind of <laughs> like it's the main character's cat and then the other main character like grabs the cat and i don't this isn't a spoiler they're the two people on the fucking poster but anyways the cat lives through the whole thing and it is it is silly it is it is comical the adventures of this pussy <laughs> very nice uh may i say i don't know why it just reminds me of uh the meg in the Meg, there was a little dog named Pippin, which in was the a th- first Meg, right? Yep, which was a throwback to Pippin, who we all know got eaten by the shark in Jaws. Yeah, because the guy was like Pippin, Pippin, and you just see the board floating in the water and no dog, so it just leaves it to the viewer to be like, okay, totally ate the dog. And in the Meg, Pippin at the like you like literally they were like in a scene where they're swimming in the open ocean and it's like, and they just look over and here's this fluffy little white dog in the middle of the ocean paddling and it's <laughs> Pippin. And then at the very end, when everything's good or whatever, at the end of the first film, you see the the girl holding Pippin. So Pippin survived. Pippin lived. It's because no one wants to see a dog or, or a cat die. No one wants to see an, a pet die, which is really funny because that, that logic of no one wants to see a pet die yeah. is why we were able to let John Wick murder people for four movies. 100%. Because it's like, he, you know, oh, a puppy died? You kill everyone, John Wick. I really think that it was completely agreed upon. We all agreed it was justified. We were like, well, the dude had to break apart the cement to get his whole arsenal because he killed his dog. We're all just like, dude, we would have helped you. I got a jackhammer. (laughs) Oh, man, but it was a good movie. I'm glad I went to a theater and see it. I want to support the theaters. I think everybody out there who likes movies should definitely support the theaters. But speaking of support, if you want to support our show, please remember to download the episode. Doesn't matter where you listen to it download it that is the best way to support us and share share if you like what you're listening to please tell your friends be like dude this podcast rules because we do we do rule we do it's important to believe in yourself and let me tell you i just look in the mirror every day and go you're doing it you're doing it fido you have to talk to me like a dog otherwise i don't get inspired so i'd pet myself in the head and be like, you're a good boy you you're, are go- a good- you're gonna make a good who's gonna make a good show you're gonna make Who's going to be entertaining to the Joe's masses? Make a good show. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and I suggest the rest of you do the same. But all right, that brings us to our first segment. Spooky stuff. The ghost of the Stanley Hotel. I want to interject here and say that we have, uh, for spooky stuff this week, we have six creepy ghost stories so enjoy because the ghost of the stanley hotel is only number one the stanley hotel in estes park colorado has been around for more than a hundred years and was built as a posh getaway for the wealthy seeking solitude in the mountains yeah because a lot of wealthy people are like you know what i'm gonna go to the mountains just be alone Oh, quiet. (laughs) As the years passed, however, the company declined, and by the 1970s, the Grand Hotel had fallen into disrepair. It was around that time that the famed author, Stephen King, spent the night there and was inspired to write the book, 
The Shining. The book and blockbuster film helped return the Stanley to its former glory. Now, guests come in droves to see the hotel that inspired one of the scariest horror movies of all time. It's true. I want to go to the hotel. I didn't realize that there was an actual hotel that was, you know, based on the Overlook. But it makes sense. It's a Colorado mountain hotel. So it was creepy haunted. I mean, it was haunted, or at least creepy enough, that Stephen King himself was inspired. It's all fun and games until you get snowed in. <laughs> Don't go to that one. What was the one room? I forget the number. It's like a repeating number, too. Oh, I don't remember. one thirty something. I want to yeah. say, right? Don't go near that effing room. Well, it was that the one you walked in and it had the rotting corpse in the bathtub? Yeah, the lady, the creepy lady, and she beat the crap out of that kid and it was just like... She beat the crap out of a kid? What are you talking about? Yeah, he was covered in bruises from her and that's when Oh, she you mean... Thought, okay, yeah. I'm sorry. That kid, you're talking yeah, about in Danny. The Shining. Yeah, 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 Danny, yeah, yeah, Danny, Danny. Yeah. Yeah, no, that was room 237, I believe. Thank you, yeah, and that's actually what's funny. Little weird little side note here. The dude who runs Pixar is obsessed with The Shining, and if you look throughout Pixar films, every now and again, you will see that number. It's a I real thing. I have no information to back that It's a real thing, I've seen it. Well, I'm going to look into that. That sounds fun. I mean, you got to pay tribute, right? He's a fan. <laughs> well, I know a lot of times they put the number of the, uh, it was like a, University of Southern California room in an animation school, like mm. it was a, and they they use that number for a lot yep. of things. That's in a lot of uh, movies. Yes. So same thing. Very cool. Given its history, it should come as no surprise that many visitors report strange happenings. Aware of the ghostly rumors, Texas resident Henry Yao booked a last minute getaway in April of 2016 to check it out. After arriving, Yao had dinner, then wandered around the Stanley to take photos. Stopping at the staircase, he waited for people to clear the area, then took a picture, thinking nothing of it. Yeah, you know, just trying to be like, I went to this creepy place from that book. Later that night, however, Yao fell seriously ill. I felt really sick. I had the shivers. I was like, something's really wrong he says. His companion suggested he go to the emergency room, but Yao refused. On the trip home, Yao began swiping through the photos he'd taken when he discovered what he said was a really, really strange image of someone standing on the stairs, except no one had been there. The next day, he posted the photo on Instagram, half-joking, that he'd captured a ghost, and the world took notice. Almost overnight, Yao found himself in the limelight, with his ghost picture warranting attention from global media outlets and paranormal experts who wanted to examine the photo. Some experts say that there's two ghosts, and other people said that the reason I got sick is because the ghost was trying to materialize, taking energy out of me, he said. There's so many theories about this. And what does Yao think? I have no idea, he says with a laugh. I definitely think the the spirit was sucking his energy out, right? Like to materialize, to take corporeal form, right? To be, Yeah, I totally believe that. It like you a, want a picture? Yeah. All right. Let Has me like, just take your body, I'll sir. I need just a nibble of your soul. <laughs> Stanley Hotel. I mean, it inspired The Shining, which, you know what's really fucked up about The Shining? is that You read it as a kid, and you're like, wow, haunted hotel. You read it as an adult, and you're like, wow, the horrors of drinking. <laughs> oh, dude, thank you. I'm glad that you said that, because honestly, I listened to the book, and it was good, but like, literally, yeah, it was way more about the drinking in the book, which I felt was like kind of weird and off-putting myself. Well, and then, <laughs> to be fair, the Stephen movie, King had a problem with drinking, so he was, like, working shit out with himself. Amongst other things, allegedly. No, it's oh, not allegedly. He did a lot of coke. Everyone oh, knows that. tons if of you, it. If you look, or if you read it, you know the guy did a lot of coke. <laughs> <laughs> he said he doesn't even remember Cujo. That's awesome. Doesn't even remember writing it. 
Full I, Coke. I wish I didn't remember the right, because it's such a struggle to write shit, man. <laughs> it's like you made a movie out of what? Your book Cujo. What's Cujo? Is that the dog one? I wrote a book about a dog? A about, why would I do that? What the hell is this movie? It's like <laughs> Stephen fucking King. Why would I write a book about a dog? They're like, dude, read it. And you know what? Read... I'm going to go. Like, could you imagine reading it later and being like, holy shit. Or just, well, what was he impressed? Was he just like, I did good work under the influence? Or was he just like, oh, dude, oh what a weird little. Surprises got published. <laughs> you know, it makes you wonder. He has like 90 books, like literally. It... I have an entire shelf. I literally have every book. Like, in some form or the other. A lot of them are new printings. It's not like it's a really expensive collection. I but I have up. every yeah. Stephen King book on a shelf. The only book I don't have is one of uh, the books he wrote under Richard Bachman. Uh, he wrote a couple books, I think three or four, under Richard Bachman. Well, there's one called Rage. And you can get that book in a collection called the Bachman Books. But it, in of itself, like, its own thing. It's like a, just a copy of Rage to $3,000. There, it is. It is. It only had a really small run, and for some reason, never got reprinted. Yeah, it like, like Stephen King's such a franchise name now, though. You know, everybody knows Stephen King uh, adaptation films, series, everything like that. The dude's iconic. There was a, a very short-lived series based on his book that was um, short stories. Maybe it was only supposed to be one season. I don't know, but it was called Nightmares and Dreamscapes, and it took a lot of the short stories from that book. It is a fun anthology show. It is. It, it, it was like a Black Mirror before Black Mirror. I loved it. Cool. Well, I think it's time for our next ghost story. <laughs> the ghost of Stone's Public House. Considered one of the most haunted restaurants in America, Stone's Public House in Ashland, Massachusetts, doesn't have a ghost problem. It has a ghost's problem. Plural, mother trucker. <laughs> Was that good? You like, yes. you make you laugh? <laughs> Janet Morazzini, a longtime resident of Ashland, is the bartender and manager of Stone's Public House, which was built by John Stone back in 1832. According to Morazzini, even before she began working at the inn, she heard stories of the ghost of a young boy roaming the halls of the restaurant, which once served as an ad hoc hospital during the what? Spanish flu uh, pandemic of 1918. So I mean, Dude, the Spanish flu killed so many people. Yeah, it was a big deal. And it's so funny, like, because of our pandemic that we all went through, you started seeing, like, Spanish flu, like, flyers kind of resurge of, like, them being like, Wear on the internet. Mask. It's yeah, crazy. It, it was. It was very similar. That is nuts. Well, I mean, the Spanish flu killed a lot of people, and it was like, you know, throughout history, the Black Plague and stuff. Uh, there's a TV show called Ghosts. I think it's on NBC or ABC. But they talk about all the ghosts in the basement being uh, ghosts from the cholera pit because people got sick with cholera. They just threw them in the basement. Oh, yeah, one of the guys from the cholera pit. Into the pit. Into the pit. Bring out your dead. I'm not dead. Ah, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> I feel happy. <laughs> Jumping back here, it makes sense, Morazzini says. That's where they would quarantine all the sick people, she explains. The cholera pit! Apparently quite a few souls have passed just due to that. The inn is also the site for other untimely deaths, including that of a young girl who was struck and killed by a train while she played near the railroad tracks bordering the property. That sucks. I don't want to make light of it, but like, don't play on the fucking tracks. Let's not. Maybe it's maybe it's a little bit of survival of the fittest there. Don't want to go down that track. <laughs> According to Morazzini, a father and son visiting the inn stepped outside the restaurant to watch the trains. After coming back inside, Morazzini heard the father reassuring his young son that there wasn't anyone else outside, despite the son insisting he'd seen a little girl sitting beside them. Creepy. He's like they they talk a lot about children being able to see ghosts. They're the innocent. They they don't have as much blocks. You know, we we yeah, block shit off. I don't know if I'd use the word the innocent, but I get what you're saying. Like they haven't had enough world experience to be tainted by perception. They're pure. Uh, yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. They can see ghosts according to a lot of myths. He's like, she was sitting right next to me. She was crying. Didn't you see the little girl? And the dad said, there was nobody there. It's just 
Me and you, buddy, Mirazidi recalls. Which is what we would say. Other ghosts are said to haunt the old inn, including that of proprietor John Stone, who Morazzini says didn't actually die there, but is believed to be watching over the place. Well, he must have had a very strong emotional connection to the place in order for his spirit to still latch on to it after death. Because if he didn't die there, it had to be like his home in his heart more than his home. Like you know what I mean? Put literal blood and sweat. He built the place. You know, it still stands. I hope to be that passionate about something I create in my life, Ryan. Besides this show. I put my blood and sweat into this show, Ryan. Then that means we can haunt the internet and go anywhere we wish. Yes, will we live forever? Because our shows are out there online. And if this server goes down, will it be on another server? Does that immortalize us? Like you say, do we travel through the cosmos of the internet? Are we forever cyber ghosts? That sounds like a Saturday morning cartoon. Cyber ghosts. What we do in life echoes in the internet. <laughs> One night, when Morazzini was alone at the inn, she says she heard footsteps walking directly above her on the second floor. I was just like, there's no explanation for that whatsoever. I'm leaving. She tells today.com, Adam, that's what you do. You get the hell out of there. Still, she doesn't believe that the spirits have bad intentions. I've never had that scary hair on the back of your neck, gotta get the hell out of the feeling kind of feeling there. Well, I think that matters, right? Because you go into places. That I, I've never had a ghost experience. I'm open to it. I'm not a, trying to be a skeptic because I'm not a skeptic. I would love to see a ghost. I haven't personally saw a ghost. But I have been in places where I had good or bad feelings, where I had, oh, shit, I got to get out of here versus... Yeah, I feel comfortable, maybe a little bit more comfortable than I normally would. So it makes sense to me. Now, you know, I don't close the door on anything, but yes, I've never seen anything myself either. With as far as ghosts are concerned. Correct. Because I know you've seen a UFO. I've seen no, don't, something. Don't backtrack. You saw the UFO. You described it to me. You called me that night. You were so sure. It was so, in the middle of the day. Yeah, well, I'm just it, saying you was, called me. Yep, and I was driving down. I-75 heading north, and it was like a perfect straight stretch, and I swear from as far as I could see to over my left shoulder, faster than you could fathom, just doof, just went by. And I could like kind of see like the sun shining off of it. Like I said, this was in the middle of the day. It was a sunny day, and uh, yeah, it blew my mind. It was so fast that, yeah, I still sit here today being like, did I happen to see that? Like, it was crazy. Well, you know what? I count that as proof. I have not seen a UFO, and I want to. But anyways, ghosts and such. I don't think uh, it's malicious. If the if they were saying that they didn't feel like they needed to get out of there, yeah, then she I, wasn't worried. Yeah, and if and that's kind of it. I mean, I if you're comfortable and you don't feel like you're in danger, chances are you're okay, unless you're a fish. And you happen to be in the ocean, yeah. and you see a beautiful light that you just got to get a good look at, and you get a little too close, watch out, because there's an angler fish. That is an angler fish, and it's going to eat you whole. Dude, don't you worry about that in life? Like, I, obviously, I don't mean like a light that draws you to it, which, by the way, Skyline, great movie. They had blue lights, drawed people in. It was an uh, alien movie, very good. But I'm just saying... That concept in life, that, that beautiful thing that draws you in and then traps you. That's what I'm always worried about, about a, uh, like a hypothetical messiah figure or something like shows up, right? The whole, I'm here to make everything better. And then it's like, you got to watch out not to be trapped. You know, whether that's a, you know, someone in politics or someone in a religion or someone in anything, just, I worry about like the drawing people into the masses because that's how a lot of Stephen King books start. Back to Stephen King. Think of Randall Flagg. Yeah. I'm just saying. Ooh, creepy. I mean, that's how that's how all the cults start. Right? Because you just have to be charismatic. Yeah. You could. It's like you talk lo long enough, and it's like you know this guy's insane. And then next thing you know, you'd be like, you know, that if I drink this Kool-Aid, I might fly to a spaceship. It's I like, don't and know. he's got to sleep with my girl now. It's a little weird, but... <sighs> I'm really know, sad gonna I got to sacrifice. He's going to take us to the comet. Yeah, he's going to take us to the comet. So, I just never know. 
You know, you know. The I, point is feelings. <laughs> Pay attention to feelings. This woman didn't think it was bad. Probably not bad. Next taunting. Here we go. <laughs> the ghosts of Willoughby Cole. By the way, I think I walked around the bush pretty well there and not tried to actually talk about anything too fucked up. The, shrub- the shrubbery remains intact. Excellent. Topical about fun things. In 1912, it became the very prosperous. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. What are we doing? The ghosts of Willoughby Cole. Ah, yes. The, bo- uh, the ghosts of Willoughby Cole. In 1912, it became the very prosperous Willoughby Cole, supplying coal to local residents before it was sold to Henry Windus in William Don Norris in the 1930s. Over time, the relationship between the two owners grew contentious. I don't like you anymore, Don. According to Theresa R.G., Henry Windus wanted to buy the business from Don Norris, but Don was unwilling to sell. Nope. The paranormal investigator says. One morning, Norris allegedly told his wife he was going out for bread and to check on repairs being done on the Willoughby building. He never returned. Several hours later, his body was discovered in front of the door. He was lying in a bloody heap, Argy says. Even though his death was ultimately ruled accidental, Argy says that the Norris's family believed that he'd been murdered. Though no one knows what really happened that morning, R.G. believes his spirit still haunts the building. We have come in contact with him on many, many occasions, she says, and claims that others have reported seeing faces in the window and heard unexplained footsteps and other unusual occurrences at the building. But Norris isn't alone. We've probably got five or six resident spirits in the building. All right, so it makes sense that the guy was murdered, he would be a ghost. But it kind of feels like a throwaway when she's like, yeah, we got like four more, too. Like uh, (laughs) Jim and uh, Terry. Don't forget about Terry and and uh, and and Melindy. Yeah. Or at least that's what we we, that's at least what we think her name is. Four ghosts. We don't think she can spell. Yeah. We used the Ouija board. We tried Spirit Box. Uh, well, it's like, I don't want to talk crap, but if, just, if it was in today's, she'd be wearing a helmet. You know, just for her own and probably others' safety. Let's be fair. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's go to the, 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 the fourth haunting now. <laughs> Sounds like it's time for a ghost nanny. Oh, a ganny, as I like to call them. Oh. Ooh, ghost nanny. A man named Kip from New York State talks of an old home that he and his wife purchased. Upon moving in, his wife invited her sister and newborn baby to come for a visit. Ah, that's gonna go well. They stayed in the downstairs bedroom, and my wife was sleeping in an upstairs bedroom, Kip says the first night their guest stayed. His wife overheard her sister talking to someone in the middle of the night. The next morning, Kip's wife asked who she'd been talking to, and her sister replied, I woke up in the middle of the night, and there was an old lady standing over my baby, and I had to tell her to get away. Ah, I just pooped. No, seriously, that is horrifying. Can you, you're a father. If you wake up and you see this fucking elderly person just staring over your child. Stop that. (laughs) You need to leave. Uh, Stop that. (laughs) I think it's time to go. According to Kip, there were more unexplained incidents in the house including mysteriously moving lamps and a creepy occurrence with a fire alarm that went off while his wife was outside working in their garden. She immediately runs back into the house, figures out that it's the smoke alarm in that same downstairs bedroom going off, Kip says. When she opened the door, she said for a split second, all she could see in the room was this white fog. Yeah, that's smoke. Within moments, however, the white, fog, the white fog disappeared, and the alarm shut off. Convinced the house... Oh, that's creepy as hell. Can you imagine coming in by your house, the alarm's going off, there looks like there's smoke everywhere, and then suddenly it's just gone, and the alarm shuts off? I, dude, all jokes aside, like, if you, be- whatever you believe in, whether it's God, demons, ghosts, whatever, 
you would believe in it in in that moment. You'd be like, okay, I'm convinced. Like, yeah, did did this just effing happen? Holy crap. You'd also have to wonder, like, would you tell anyone? Because I just feel like if I see something that I 100... I mean, I'm going to say it on the podcast. But if I see something that I know would be crazy in the mind of a rational person, I would have a hard time telling them. I would have a hard time being like, no, really, I saw this. Yeah. Oof. That's, well, that's scary, man. Phantom well, fire. Well, thank goodness for our podcast. There are there are people out there that that'll tell the story. I'm gonna tell you guys every weird thing that happens to me, <laughs> <laughs> whether you want it or not. Well, you can tune in, so it's up to you. Let's jump back into Kip's wife here. Convinced the house was haunted, Kip's wife reached out to a neighbor to learn more about the property and discovered that the previous owner was a 90-year-old woman who tragically died in a house fire. Well, there you go. Needless to say, we fixed up the house and got out of there as fast as we could and moved someplace else, says Kip. Because well, that's ex- a lot of smart people on this on these stories. Right? Yeah, just go. My wife has a joke where she just, uh, she's always just like, that's it, burn the house down, time to leave. <laughs> yep. Why stay in Poltergeist? Why did they stay in that house after the fr- I mean, once the girl is taken, that makes sense because you, you can't leave your daughter. But before that, w- you had time to leave before your daughter was abducted through that magic portal in the closet. Like the chairs are magically moving in the kitchen. This is fun. Get the hell out of there. Get the hell out of there. Like mm-hmm. grandma's in the cemetery. Next ghost story. <laughs> the grandma's in the cemetery. Jeff, a resident in Dayton, Ohio, was driving with his three-year-old son, Miles, in the back seat when they passed by a cemetery. It was a modest cemetery with only flowers and small plaques. Yeah, you know. It basically looks like a giant garden, Jeff explains. According to Jeff, as they drove by his toddler, who'd been happily singing, abruptly stopped pointed to the cemetery and exclaimed, Look at all those people. Oh, that's horrifying. Jeff turned to look, but didn't see a soul. Confused, he asked Miles what he was talking about. All those people over there, his son replied. There sure are a lot of grandmas. <laughs> As Jeff tells it, Kid chills logic. ran down his spine, and he asked his son what the people were doing. They're all standing there, looking down at the grass. Miles said. Completely unsettled by the conversation, Jeff sped up and drove home. Later that same day, he says his young son was watching TV when he turned to Jeff and said, You know, they weren't alive. (laughs) Oh, fuck. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Thinking Miles was referring to the cartoon, Jeff asked what he meant. Those people we saw... They were all path. They were all paused, is what he says. They were all paused. Huh. His son replied. I don't know if my kid has the sixth sense, Jeff said, or if he just has a wild imagination. But either way, F that. <laughs> yeah, that would be, I'd be like, <laughs> and we're never driving near that place again. We might even leave the state. Don't go near that road. That's it. Burn the house down. Get the hell out. <laughs> well. And in speaking of get the hell out, gosh, my most least favorite of the hauntings, this next one is called The Haunted Ventriloquist Doll. Haunted dolls have just been in pop culture and mythology forever. I mean, first thing pops in my head is Charlie, but they have, uh, you know, Charlie, Chucky. They have uh, Dolly Dearest. They have, uh, Miss, what is it, uh, Demonic Toys. And then you've got Slappy. From R.L. Stein. Slappy from R.L. Annabelle from the Blumhouse films. Dude, just no thank you. I'm good. Either and way. S- Slappy from Goosebumps is a good example because that actually is a ventriloquist. He doll. was effing petrifying. There was a few uh, Twilight Zones and a bunch of things that had the ventriloquist like demon doll. Uh, and uh, I believe there was a Tales from the Crypt. Oh, I'm sure there was. So here we go. Strap in. When Marty Thrapping. Thrapping. When Marty was a child back in the 90s, she was a fan of the ventriloquist 
Edgar Bergen in his dummy sidekick, Charlie McCarthy. She says that when her father came across a ventriloquist doll as he wandered through a small magic shop located outside of Santa Rosa, California, he decided to buy it for her birthday. While ringing up the sale, Marty says the cashier gave her father weird vibes and said to him, you know, when you put your hand inside the doll, he's going to come alive. Oh, well, that's horrifying. Laughing off the moment, he bought the dummy and brought it home to his daughter. According to Marty, she was over the moon when her dad gave her the doll, saying, I was so happy when I got that doll. I was obsessed. But before long, strange things began happening through impossible, though impossible because the doll's head was made of hard plastic. She says its expression would change, including his smile. Worried something would happen to her precious dummy, Marty's family shut it away in a, car, in a cupboard for most nights. One night, she and her family were awakened by the pitter-patter of steps in their living room. Thinking it was the dog or another family member, they went to look. No one was there except for the doll that was sitting on the couch. <laughs> I don't know, man. That is that is messed up. <laughs> that is messed up, Joe. Yeah. How many toys have you had that you thought would come in alive and running around your house? I've got only one, and I still have it in possession, technically. It belonged to my grandmother, and it's a German porcelain doll, and that thing is... Positively petrifying. I oh, my it, God. And I, and I inherited it, and I still have it. We got to talk more about that later. Oh, I'll bring her in. Oh, my God. Yeah, do it. Jesus. She's she's terrifying. <laughs> so back to this terrifying story. We remember specifically we always put it away because I love that doll so much that I took care of it, Marty says. Other strange occurrences began happening. While Marty and her dad were away... Her uncle was alone in the house. The uncle says he heard Marty's father calling his name from the living room, even though he wasn't home. <gasps> when he went to look, he found the doll, once again, sitting on the couch, and no one else. All of our family was pretty much scared of the doll, Marty says. People would just start hearing their names being called, and we would hear walking at night. So we just decided we needed to get rid of it. Dude, that really creeps me out. <laughs> Can you imagine just hearing, Ryan? No. Ryan. I can't. Dude, fuck that. No. Ryan. I live alone. No. <laughs> That's not what I need right now. That is not what I need right now. I live on, like, the third story, and I can't really escape. Just a little <laughs> running. Fuck me running. Better, 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 better. better. No. All right, I'm ju so that Joe doesn't give me nightmares, I'm jumping back in. I'm the leprechaun. <laughs> Whoa! Stop it, wing! Whoa! Being Mexican and religious, Marty says her parents wanted to burn the doll in case it was demonic. Yeah, that tracks. But that's not a good idea, right? Because then it can escape. I don't give a shit. Let it escape somewhere else. <laughs> they put it on the grill, and according to Marty, it wouldn't burn. No matter how much A1 sauce they added. I'm just kidding. Oh, man. Can you imagine, like, having this thing that wouldn't set on fire that you thought was evil? Add more sauce. <laughs> this doll would not go up in flames at all. Whatsoever. They tried cutting it up with a knife, but were unsuccessful. Finally, they threw it in the trash can. After the tra garbage was collected, Marty's dad went to retrieve the bin. In it? The doll. <laughs> to rid themselves of the dummy, they dug a hole in the backyard, then filled it with cement. Yeah, that seems appropriate. I'd do that. Marty and family have long since moved away, but she says they still think about the doll and the possibility that eventually it finds one of us. Oh, my God. Can you imagine... Ryan, no. like getting something from like a <laughs> flea market or like an old shop. I mean, okay, if there's a creepy person selling it and they tell you, you know it comes alive, you do realize that they're saying that because they can fall back on the conscience of being like, I told them. So if someone does that to you, don't buy the item. 
Yeah, don't. Come if, on, we all saw Gremlins. Yeah, if they're handing you something and they're just like, you know if you make a wish, it'll be the opposite of what you want. Like, whatever cryptic bullshit they're saying, stay away. Earthling Entertainment Special Report! So, Despicable Me 4 looks like it killed it at the box office with a $122 million opening weekend. That's right, even though it's coming in with some mediocre reviews, so we'll see if there's a big drop-off for, you know, the next weekend. In any case, Despicable Me, big win! This has been an Earthling Entertainment Special Report! Wyatt's Disclosure Discussion. <laughs> it's about aliens and stuff. It's my favorite part. Here we go. Red Rocks. UFO witness comes forward with new details on mass sighting. Yes, a lot of people saw this. Very cool. This comes to us from Coast to Coast, AM.com. The Red Rocks Amphitheater Worker who reported a mass UFO sighting, has come forward with additional details regarding the remarkable event. News of the curious case, which took place in early June, went viral over the weekend after a Colorado media outlet first unearthed the account sent to the National UFO Reporting Center. Uh, hours after the incident unfolded, the then-anonymous submission revealed how a dozen workers observed a massive, disc-shaped metallic craft that appeared in the sky about a mile away from the Colorado concert venue. A dozen is nothing to turn your nose up to, man. That, yeah. That is 12 people who are all corroborating the same story. Yes. With the report gaining widespread attention, one hoped that the, re that the source of the story would reveal their identity and share more information about the sighting and, as luck would have, just such a scenario has occurred. Michael Lemon confirmed to the Denver Gazette that he was the Red Rocks worker who contacted the uh, National UFO Reporting Center about the sighting. He explained that the incident happened while the workers were breaking down the equipment following a June 5th concert by the band All Time Low. According to Lemon, they were able to observe an object because there was very little moonlight that evening. That said, he also noted that the dark color of the anomaly blended in with the sky pretty well, unquote. Easily the most tantalizing detail shared by Lamon, who described himself as a hopeful skeptic, was that one of the workers shined a flashlight at the sizable disc, which led to the UFO vanishing in a manner that likened to something activating a cloaking device. And I actually have a separate quote right here that was reported to the National UFO Reporting Center. What's even crazier is that as soon as we all started noticing it and stopped what we were doing to pay attention to it, the craft tipped at an angle and slowly started moving belly first to the east. And employ the, the employee that now we know his name, Lamon, reported, and that's super important because keeping up with this podcast, you know that we love the gimbal video. The gimbal video shows a pivoting UFO heading towards its destination, which was also reported by Bob Lazar, who says to have witnessed this firsthand when it came to these test sites, which he was not allowed to go to after he was fired, and he got in big trouble for doing it. Yeah, but, you know, there's a similar thing that people are saying, a similar type of, of, of flight pattern that these UFOs seem to be following. And the, Very cool. The fact that cooperative by this, yeah, right. And it's like, is it one of ours? Is it reverse engineered? Like what Bob Lazar was saying, they were attempting to do. Have they figured it out, or are we actually still seeing these beings, be it extra, extra dimensional, extraterrestrial, ex whatever? Yeah, the theory of uh, this all happened with the alien craft from like Roswell and all that other stuff, and we haven't actually seen aliens since them, and everything we've seen since them has been reverse engineered our stuff. That's a creepy thought. I didn't like it when X-Files took that route. I got to be honest. They were all like, aliens, aliens, aliens. And the latter seasons, they were like, government, hey, government, 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 government. All right. Well, he, I like to think they're aliens. I, I do. I like to think it's half. I, I would like to think at this point, it's probably half and half. Sure. That makes sense. And, they're, and neither of them want to be seen. So it's just 
a happenstance. Like they, like he talks about a cloaking device here. Like uh, he says, uh, as for why nobody in the group thought to take a picture of the odd object, he attributed this to the brevity of the sighting, which lasted only about 30 seconds. Sure, yeah, you know, sometimes you don't pull out your phone quick enough because you're just looking at the damn thing going, oh. I think that all the time, that all this skepticism, like, oh, why don't you, dude, if I'm seeing something, probably my last thought is going to be to bust out my phone because I'm just going to be so busy looking at it. Yeah, I mean, unless you go out somewhere with the intention of trying to capture photos or videos of these things, like, if you're caught off guard, it doesn't necessarily occur to you. Yeah, that's why I think some of the best UFO videos we get are hampered stands. Like, it's just a person was videotaping, and then all of a sudden it's like, what the hell was that? So right here. And that, with everyone, was initially busy tending to the concert equipment. So they were all working when the anomaly first appeared. Lamont also revealed that the incident continues to be the talk of the team of workers at Red Rocks. I mean, of course. Though, as of now, he is the only witness from the group to come forward. To share the wild story, you know, giving his name. Well, like I said earlier, sometimes something crazy happens. You don't know, you know, you don't want to look like you're crazy. I mean, you see it, you know, it's real, but you don't want to tell someone else that you witnessed something that they were going to perceive as you being batshit. And if you missed last week's episode, we talked to someone who was a complete contactee. Nancy Timms. Yes, Nancy Times and Timms. And uh, it's. It's so I'm I'm so glad that we're in a time when people can speak out about their experience without the worry, I think. I think it's getting to the point where almost your average person just accepts that it's a thing. They might not be as geeky about it as we are, but they're I, believing it's more likely. So yeah, if you want to check out our interview with Nancy Timms, who is a lifelong contactee, yeah. That was in uh last week's episode, episode forty four, I believe. And, and it's it's honestly a really great interview she had a lot to say she was it was amazing and we want to do more like it uh but i the end of this article says it remains to be seen whether he will be joined by any others or if the case will simply fade away like the object that mystified the group that night and that was another thing is uh i saw another quote here that was reported to the national ufo reporting center then it started fading away until it was invisible it didn't shoot off into the distance it simply dissolved into the ether. Ooh. We all watched it vanish. This is from the same guy who. So this was his original statement before he gave his name. Now, well, we don't know if that's the same guy. You're, You're speculating. You, you that's are, true. are I, speculating. And Joe's the correct. Same guy. Joe's correct. I am speculating because at this time, this is an earlier story. So I don't know who this could be. This could be anybody on his team. But, you know, it, it, it brings uh, attention to the idea of extra dimensional beings ra rather than aliens, because if they phase into another dimension, perhaps, you know what I mean? Right. Is it technology? They or could is it literally just... be altering their vibration of their own molecules to be on a different plane of existence. And can we even possibly, can our eyes even possibly wrap itself around? Like, would you even know what you're looking at when you're watching something phase between these different dimensions that we we don't understand so like to us it would look like a cloaking device but really it's just our eyes are like what the what the fuck yeah <laughs> just we don't know how to respond to this like it makes sense to me oh and with that we are here at the entertainment section that's right you've reached the latter half of the show so strap in music bubbles this week's music mumbles slipknot's Corey taylor's paranormal experiences this comes to us from Loudwire.com. Uh, Slipknot, Slipknot's Corey Taylor has had a number of paranormal experiences over the years, something he tried to come to terms with in his book. Quote, a funny thing happened to me on the way to heaven is I, the name I, of the book. Yeah, I like that name. A funny thing happened to me on the way to heaven. Like that. That's, <laughs> that's a pretty good one. I don't know if it's a good autobiography title, but it's a good like, you know, book title in general. I'm interested. I'll probably listen to it. I, I love I love Corey. Yeah, I love Corey. <laughs> uh, while out promoting the book, he shared some of the bizarre experiences from his life with Huffington Post. He recalls instances of thermoses flying across the kitchen and hearing footsteps behind him on hardwood floors, only to turn and find no one there. Which would be like the most terrifying thing, because I don't I'm always paranoid I'm being followed. And you're all you know, if you hear footsteps behind you, you turn around, there's nothing. My first thought wouldn't be ghost. It'd be that, oh, dude, someone's, like, hiding, and they're going to, like, jump me. 
Right, and the fact that you don't see them, it's like, so yeah, they're obviously hiding, so that's no good. Yeah, that's that, 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 they're probably not coming up to say, hey, what's up, man? How's it going? They're, they're, you know, they, they might want to do some nefarious things. Then again, flying thermoses, we're back to ghosts. Yes. <laughs> and that would explain a lot of Corey Taylor's music. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Taylor revealed that one of his earliest experiences came when he and some of the fellow neighborhood kids explored a nearby abandoned house. We called it Cold House, said Taylor, likening it to the kind of place you dare your friends to enter. One night, a group of his friends decided to explore the place together. We were all standing on the first floor of this place. It was two stories. And this thing came down the stairs at us, explained Taylor. It was the silhouette of a man and was kind of backlit in a way from its own energy. It came down the stairs at us. We flipped out, killed ourselves running out of the house. My leg went through the rotted wood on the front porch, and I still have a scar on my shin. That is interesting, right? So that definitely happened if he's got the scar. But would you think they saw a ghost? Do you think that's genuine? It could be. I've never seen a ghost. I want to. Yeah, I've This never whole se- episode's about ghosts, man. I mean, he swears they saw something, but they were young, and it was in a ho- in a you know abandoned house. So, you know, it could be scary, or you know, maybe it was a homeless. Maybe it was, maybe it was a homeless. A it homeless could have been a homeless who, who had a fluorescent jacket. Yes. Got to watch out for them homeless. Hi, <laughs> baby. So whether it was ghost or homeless, that's how you spook Kate, uh, Corey Taylor and to make it or to be in Slipknot. Yes, yes. Well, yeah. Uh, some of his lyrics uh, they track with that that he's probably seen a haunting or two. That makes sense. He is a haunted artist, if you will. I'll say so. Well, you know what? I'm going to check out his book. That's a, a funny thing happened on the way to heaven. That sounds really yeah. that, like I like the title. I'm going to I'm going to get the book. And he's got quite a way with words. Like I don't mind listening to him talk. Like Well, he's a lyricist. Right. Yeah, and he's super successful. Let's face it. Like he's no matter what you have to say about Slipknot, like I've seen them in so many eras live and each time they just blow me away. Awesome. Yeah, I've only got to see them once, and uh, they're really good. They put on a hell of a show, that's for sure. It's mind-blowing, and and the audience is mind-blowing. They know every word. (laughs) I think it was kind of early. I was in high school, so I don't remember the audience chanting every word. It was still when they only had, I think Iowa came out. It was when they toured with Iowa. It's what a god, oh, dude. That their been... second album with Corey Taylor, because their first album was Mate, Feed, Kill, Repeat, and that had a different singer. Yes. And then they did what people call, like, I don't know, the numbers album, the one with just all the numbers that they've got. I thought that was a self titled. Basically self titled, but I always called it the numbers album because sure, it sure, had sure. the numbers there. And uh, I got to see them for that album. And then I missed out on Iowa. But then I saw them when they did the subliminal verses. And then I saw them again. After Paul Gray had died for the, I believe, the Gray chapter. Sure, yeah. And the, and each time blew me away. Well, yeah. Hell of, hell of an artist. And you know what? Maybe he's seen a ghost. Well, guys, now we're moving on. Remember that guy? Remember that gal? Well, now they're dead. John Landau, the Oscar winning. Landau. Landau, the Oscar winning producer behind Titanic and Avatar dies at 63 this comes to us from ign.com as reported by the rap a source close to landau's family shared that he died after a battle against cancer landau was born on july 30th 1960 in new york new york and was the son of producers ellie and eddie landau he grew up in the world of film and would go on to attend USC's School of Cinematic Arts to train for a professional life in Hollywood. Throughout the 1990s, Landau served as executive vice president of feature film production at 20th Century Fox, but one of his biggest claims to fame was undoubtedly his work as the producer on Titanic, alongside becoming the first movie to ever cross $1 billion dollars. It was also the highest grossing film of the time until James Cameron surpassed himself and released Avatar in 2009. Landau won an Oscar for producing Titanic, and he would earn another Academy Award nomination for working with Cameron again on Avatar. Yeah, well, the guy won your, you get an Oscar working with a director, you're going to do it again, and you know what? There you go. 
Avatar. It was the uh, groundbreaking. I mean, like, it's one of those movies that I admit, like, it's not like my favorite, but it's insane to watch it. Like, it's just, it blows your mind how good it is. The second one was amazing. Yeah, technically. And, you know, James Cameron's always pushing for new effects and new things in filmmaking. I mean, Terminator did it. Uh, Terminator 2 did it. He always he always pushes it a little farther. That's why these movies take so long. The You know, Avatar came out in 2009. And then the next one was like 2022. It's like, holy shit. He's supposed to have like five of them. I hope this guy plans on living till he's like 140. Yeah, it's crazy, and I got to experience all of it in Disney World because they had this whole ride, and they got two rides, actually. Oh, yeah? Set of up Avatar? for Avatar. Yep, and there's a whole world in Animal Kingdom when at night, like, you even see, like, those little, like, helicopter, like, fairy things, like, yeah, that yeah. float around, and they're literally everywhere. It, it looks like Pandora. You seriously feel like you're on Pandora. It's like this little section of the park. Well, that that's pretty cool. And yeah, also the John Landau got to produce that one too. So yeah. this guy, oh, this guy had a hell of a career. Yep, alongside Avatar: The Way of Water, which I like, I said was fan. I saw it 3D in theater; it was amazing. Landau also produced and co-produced Dick Tracy. Not so much. I honestly have never seen it. I always wanted it's to. It's such a weird movie. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. That movie's fantastic. The classic. Solara. The yeah, Solaris. That was okay. Alita. Battle Angel. I liked it, but I don't think it made any money. And more. <laughs> Ooh, I love more. More was the best. You know what I want, Ryan? More, more. 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 <laughs> Landau was still very much involved in the future of the Avatar franchise and even helped share the first behind the scenes image of Avatar 3 back in 2023. It'll be 10 more years before that film comes out. He was also very involved in such other Avatar projects like the video games Avatar Frontiers of Pandora and bringing Pandora to life at Walt Disney World. Look at us ahead of the, of the article uh, uh, there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I did play the, uh, well, I played very little of the Avatar game. It was made by Unisoft, the people who do Far Cry. Yeah. So I'm excited <laughs> to play more of the game, but I just got, uh, I got distracted by Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which is the second chapter in the trilogy that is a remake of Final Fantasy VII. So, needless to say, with a little baby in the house, I don't get to play much. It's going to be a while before I finish a 70-hour game. Well, here's my question. <laughs> when is the fantasy going to finally be final? They've been saying it's the Final Fantasy so many times. It's like, Since, like, the 80s, well, man. Well, this is just misleading. You're, you're selling this new game like, no, 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 this is the Final Fantasy. Like, it's like, oh, okay, well, I got to play the final one. Okay, well, here's, here, here's the answer, Ryan, is because <laughs> most of these uh, games are, like, world-altering apocalyptic, and most of the games take place you know, in their own world. So it's that world's final fantasy. Uh, uh? But then that's thrown out the window when they started making sequels like Final Fantasy X-2. That is the thing. Final Fantasy X-2. Final Fantasy XIII-2 and three. I rest my case. Yeah, it doesn't make much sense. <laughs> I'm but just, all right. I'm just fucking around, but I just think that's funny. Like <laughs> John Landau, you will be best. Yes, we went off on a tangent there, Mr. Landau, but thank you for all of your work. That shit was awesome. Definitely. All right, so strap in and get ready for Earthling Entertainment Headlines. Arkham Asylum TV series not moving forward at max. Wah, wah, wah. I love Arkham Asylum. Good game. I never played them. This comes to us from Variety.com. The planned Arkham Asylum TV series is no longer moving forward at max, Variety has learned. As Variety exclusively reported in October 2022, Antonio Campos had come on board to serve as writer and showrunner of the series, which was originally meant to be set within the world of Matt Reeves' The Batman. The Batman! With Robert Pattinson. Yes. But according to an individual with knowledge of the situation... I love individuals. That seems so shitty. According to Deep Throat, some guy I met in the parking lot once... This person does not want to lose their job. Exactly. <laughs> Campos's version will not proceed. It is still possible, though, that a new project set within the infamous Gotham City Asylum could be developed in the future, the individual noted. Well, it's a hot property, so of course they might make one in the future. Yes, this, this anonymous tip here in this article. But this ends the, the journey of this show, apparently. It had quite a, quite a lot of iterations, I hear. 
Right. It says, thus ends, at least for now, the show's complicated path to the screen. It was originally announced in July 2020 with a series commitment, but at that time it was meant to focus on the inner workings of the Gotham PD as featured in The Batman. Kind of like they had that show on Fox called Gotham, and it was uh, Jim Gordon was the, the main character. So maybe it was originally going to be like something like that, I guess. I, I wonder how successful that was. Uh, well, it lasted like six seasons, so well, I mean, it was good. good. And they had a young Batman. He was like Batman when he was like 14. I think the show ended where he actually was Batman, probably. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, Terrence Winter was attached to write and executive produce, but he left the project in November of 2020 due to creative differences. Ah, the good old creative differences. That's what we say when we're not going to release the real reason. Right. <laughs> yeah, you got Hey, you know what? That's, a, that's how you got to put it sometimes. Uh, forgive me if I mispronounce this. Uh, Giri and Haji, the creator of Joe Barton, was then brought in to write but warner brothers ultimately parted ways with barton as well okay so the second writer didn't didn't work out all right having a little trouble there yeah (laughs) reeves would then say in an interview in 2022 that the gotham pd show was not happening but that the story had started to evolve into what became the arkham asylum show which he described as being like a horror movie or a haunted house that is arkham See, that would be really fun. I was, you know, because Arkham is the the hospital for the criminally insane. You know what I mean? And a lot of the Batman villains aren't straight up criminals, so they end up going there. But think about it, you know, Two-Faced as like a burn victim all freaking out. You got the Riddler, a crazy guy who's doing puzzles and, you know, all these creatures and people. And it's just, you could have a haunted house, man. I, I would, I could actually see a real haunted house themed that way if they could pull it off, you know, without... Especially, yeah, especially Scarecrow, because he can make people hallucinate with his uh, drugs, essentially. Well, let's hope that they're not going to actually go that far. Well, in the haunted house, I don't know. I mean, maybe if we, maybe we'll, we'll get like a boat and go to international waters and then have a haunted house there. And if anyone goes to a haunted house in international waters, that's your own fault. <laughs> <laughs> at, yeah, at that point, you've signed, you've signed the waiver, yeah. even if you didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anywho. And back to this thing. Uh, so, <laughs> anyways, Campos then joined, but not long after that, it was announced that James Gunn and Peter Safran would be taking over DC Studios and launching a rebooted film and television universe. Yes, yes. Basically, James Gunn completely rebooting all the movies, and he also wants to make all the TV shows uh, connected in the same universe. That's why this is relevant, is because any show that they were working on would have to now fit into whatever overall universe that James Gunn and Peter Safran are putting together. Right. They can't have it, you know, confusing the fans too much. They'll piss them off. Yeah. Well, the, so the whole idea is to tie everything together. So that's, you know, the, an obvious reboot, no matter how good that version was, they had to alter it from that point. I wonder what they're going to do. Like, they'll probably continue with the Joker. Now. I think if the se- if this second Joker movie does really well, I could really see them like almost building a whole new, well, they don't have a choice but to keep the Joker in its own universe. It's not going to connect to the overall DC no. universe. It's going to be an Elseworlds. And that's because it came out before, uh, you know, anything that they were rebooting. So they had no choice because it got a billion dollars and it has an Oscar winner. So it's not like they can just pretend like it doesn't exist. Now, if the second one flops, I guarantee they just ignore it because yeah. Superman doesn't come out until next summer. So they don't have to even worry about it fitting into the universe because it would have happened before the universe was launched. I just, I could see them, like, really fitting Batman into that series, like, 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 by force almost, right? Like, the, like, in its own way. Hmm. Like, they could, they could have him, like, because he's already. If it it takes place in Arkham, you got to follow, like, a doctor or something in Arkham, because Batman's not going to just hang out in the insane asylum all the time. Right. You could have him show up for an episode, for sure, but. Well, I was saying with this new, with the new Joker, like, I could see, like, if they did, like, a third Joker, they could totally work Batman in. Well, they really can't because they established in the first Joker movie that Batman was like 10. So in order for this to happen, they'd have to age Joaquin Phoenix up. And do you really want to see like a guy in his late 20s beat up like a 67 year old man? Oh, right. Mike Tyson, Jake is Paul. Yeah. Oh, (laughs) relevant reference is relevant. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Back to the show. (laughs) In a series of social media posts in December 2023, Gunn said that the show 
was still in development and clarified that it was meant to be set within the new DCU rather than in the same world as the Batman. See, told you. This is not to say that the world Reeves built in the Batman will lie follow. The Penguin, a crime drama series with Colin Farrell reprising the role of the titular supervillain, is scheduled to debut on Max in September. Yeah, and that's actually a really big deal. They've been working on it a while. It was delayed because of the strikes, but he played the Penguin in that Batman movie where Robert Pattinson, yeah. Well, it's the same character, and apparently it takes place after the movie The Batman, and he's trying to basically fill the power vacuum that was created by the spoiler death of Val Koenig. Yes, yes. And, and, and the transformation with the makeup and costume is, is insane. Yeah, because you're like, you know, uh, Colin Farrell, like that, the handsome Irish man, like I don't know if he could play the, the penguin. I mean, when you hear Danny DeVito, you're like, that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but like... Yeah, and you're right with the makeup. He pulled it off. He, totally he did a did. great it, penguin. It was incredible. That was probably one of the most shocking like things that they did with that new series was how they transformed that man. Well, that comes out in the fall. We'll see if it's any good. Extraordinary. Reeves is also at work on the Batman Part 2, though the film's release date was recently pushed back from October 2025 to October 2026. Yeah. Gunn and Saffron, meanwhile, are currently deep into relaunching DC's interconnected film and TV universe. Production is now underway on a new Superman film starring David Cornsweet. Oh, his name always blows my mind. His last his last name is Cornsweet. Yes. Yes. I just, uh, I, I don't know. I feel like at some point an agent was like, all right, do you want an actor's name? <laughs> you know, Emilio Estevez's last name is not Estevez. It's like, should we go with Smith? <laughs> David Smith. It sounds Ooh, good. Yes. With, with multiple other films in the works. It was also <laughs> recently announced that a Green Lantern ooh, TV series has been greenlit. Oh, it's oh. called Lanterns. But it will be branded as an HBO original rather than Max due to a new content delineation HBO and Max boss Casey <laughs> Bloys revealed to Variety in June, whatever the F that means. I'll tell you what that means. It means, uh, so David Zasloff from Discovery a, f- a few years ago now bought Warner Brothers and now... Warner Brothers is owned by Discovery. And what happened is when they had the merger, they decided that they would rebrand their HBO Max, uh, you know, streaming to just be Max and get rid of the HBO because they want to basically, re, you know, be like, it's a new era. We're running stuff now. Unfortunately, HBO has been around for, you know, 30, 40 years and is a very trusted label you know when you hear yeah. hbo you're like that's quality you know you think of game of thrones you think of sopranos i was gonna say know, before... tony soprano over here like oh you think you can just exactly behind think there's a bunch of it us? so rather th- so basically they're backtracking and uh they're now labeling certain shows as hbo shows instead of max originals because they had changed the streaming service to max got it so, so yeah it's just, so they're HBO using hbo's being... name again and i guarantee that give it a year they're going to change the name of Max back to HBO Max. Just remember who you are. Exactly. <laughs> the overlords of HBO. Aha! Well, that brings us to headline number two. Skydance secures deal to buy majority stake in Paramount Global. That is a big deal. That is one of the oldest studios in Hollywood. It is the oldest, like, backlot in Hollywood. This comes to us from Nerdist.com. We love it when companies buy each other, don't we, folks? We can all agree Disney buying 900 things has been great for entertainment landscape, consumerism, and society as a whole. Why, yes, I am being sarcastic. But we live in a capitalist hellscape, and this kind of thing will keep happening. (laughs) Case in point, we now have David Ellison's Skydance Media reaching an agreement with Shari Redstone to buy out her majority stake in National Amusements, which in turn gives them control over all of Paramount Global, including Paramount Film and TV Studios, Paramount Plus, CBS, and cable channels like Nickelodeon, MTV, and Comedy Central. 
We saw the news via The Hollywood Reporter. The buyout is still pending regulators okay, but assuming it all goes through, Ellison would become the CEO of Paramount. With former NBC Universal CEO Jeff Schell currently working for the Redbird Capital, one of the financiers of the deal, taking over as president. Evidently, the months-long speculation over whether the Skydance Paramount deal would happen depended on kicking enough benefit to the other shareholders besides Redstone. Rich people need to make sure that they get more rich, after all. I mean, come on. I mean, come you can't expect them to just get the gold plated. They need the diamonds. It's like, sure, I have enough money to let me live in Bali for the rest of my life. But what about my grandchildren? <laughs> and the private jet must be superb. And who is to feed my narwhal? Who? Who? I ask you, who? It, it is. It requires many fish. So many. You'd never know. And I only feed it mackerel. Only the best. <laughs> Simply the best <laughs> for my narwhal. Right. Simply the best. This uh, kind of thing <laughs> sucks. <laughs> How will this change things like Paramount Plus's rates or programming? Or whether the cable networks will keep operating as they are? Will shake out in the near future. Hopefully, they don't prematurely cancel Star Trek Strange New Worlds. That'd be the worst case scenario for sci-fi people. It's true, because that is not only... The greatest Star Trek show out right now. It could be the best Star Trek show since the next generation. It's That's only right. logical. It's uh, well done. Thank you. You, you tried. I know I you're not a best. Trek person. I, I well, watched you, the original series. Well, that is better than most people. So uh, congratulations. Because it was only two seasons. Thank you. It was only two seasons and it was a great watch. And I watched uh, all of the movies oh, from man. that original cast. I think there was seven or eight. Uh, there's about seven, and then uh, we get to Next Generation, and they have four movies. And I wa I really enjoyed J.J. Abrams' three that he did. Yes, the Kelvin timeline, as we call it. It was excellent. That's it what was. got that's what got me into Trek. Actually, was 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 that I watched the that J.J. one, and then I went back and watched the original. You know, a lot of purists when it comes to Star Trek say that they don't like the J.J. ones because they they're like, oh, it's too actiony and not like sciency, and you know, blah 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 blah. And it's like you're right. But just the simple fact that entertainment is different now. If you watch TV shows and movies now, they're faster paced. They usually are more action-y. And you watch old films that are considered classics. They could spend an entire 10 minutes in like one shot with two people talking at a bar. You know, it's just a different kind of filmmaking. Yeah. Now, that's my that's that's my excuse for why I think the J.J. one was more action-y. And then that's a lot the same reason why people weren't a huge fan of uh, Discovery. I mean, a lot of people like Star Trek Discovery, but it was the, the first Paramount Plus series. And my only criticism is they, for some reason, they decided to change the way uh, the Falk, uh, not the Falcons, the uh, Klingons look. So the Klingons, are the, uh, Klingons are the bad guys, but they don't look like they do in any other Star Trek show. Huh. It annoyed me. I always just imagine uh, the dude from Back to the Future. I always forget his name. Uh, the dude who played Biff. the Doc. No, the dude who played the Doc. Christopher Lloyd. Thank you. Christopher Lloyd as a Klingon. That's that's what Klingons will always be to me. Why? Because he was a Klingon. In, when? It was in one, one of the movies? It was one of the movies. All right, fair enough. And, and, it's been and, a while since I saw the oh, the original cast movies. It was pretty cool seeing him speak Klingon. Not going to lie. Oh, Christopher Lloyd. Got to love it. And and because... I, hold on. Christopher Lloyd is like, I'm going to kill you because I talk like this. I'm in a tune town. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're talking about Roger Rabbit. And uh, that but, was my favorite one. Yes, but uh, but J.J. Abrams doing that trilogy two of Star Trek, isn't that pretty much what got him the job for Star Wars? One could say. That's you know, you thought. rebooted this sci-fi franchise, so now reboot this sci-fi franchise. And to be fair, The Force Awakens, in my opinion, was a great film. And, and the other ones, I have qualms with this and that, but I I still can enjoy that trilogy. Sure, The Force Awakens was a was a great film. Uh, the problem is. Ryan Johnson, I'm not talking stuff on him. He's a good filmmaker, but he probably wasn't a good choice for Star Wars because yeah. he decided to do his own thing rather than take any of the threads that J.J. put out there. The problem is if you don't continue any of those threads, then all of a sudden we're like, we didn't even mention the Knights of Ren. You know, we didn't mention, there's a bunch of things we didn't mention in that second film. So then the third film was just like, oh shit, how do we tie this up to be like one story? Because- 
I would argue that the Last Jedi, while it could, while it might be considered a sequel to the Force Awakens, it is not a second part of a trilogy. I feel like the best way to say it is like it's like this one kid who built his toy and he made it, and it's such a nice toy, and he built it, and and he made it really interesting, and it was really cool, and it did all this action stuff, and then and then Disney was like, okay, now you have to share, and they and, and he, so JJ hands it over to Ryan. And then when Ryan's done with it, it's just smashed and bang, and just banged up and just mashed together with glue and yeah, it's all so glued if you're... up on the shit. And, <laughs> it's like, oh and my god! Just, and it's like, okay, now you're gonna have to make it for presentation tomorrow. And you're, just, he was just like, what? What do yeah, I do? That's why you know the Rise of Skywalker <laughs> wasn't that great because he's just like, fuck, dude. <laughs> have... Somehow Palpatine returned. All right. Yeah, like, all, all right. right. I To be fair, I wrote, like, a 30-minute explanation, but they were like, cut it for time. Okay, fine. Somehow we returned, I guess. The 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 shining star, though, of Rise of Skywalker, if ever you choose to sit down and watch it again, folks, I'm telling you, just enjoy C-3PO. They gave him a lot of comedy. And, like, he had, like, all the best lines in Rise of Skywalker. Like, he really stole the show. I think the best part of Rise of Skywalker was Dominic Monaghan. I think he was the best part of that movie because he showed up as a rebel and he is from Lost and he was Mary in uh, in Lord of the Rings. I remember and telling you about it. He's just there <laughs> and he's just like, he, he talks, he has a few lines and you're just like, is this guy important? Where has he it was been? Not- he was just, he's like, hi, I'm here. What's up? They're fucking rebels, man. And there's the empire, man. We're going to call him first order. And you're just like, Charlie? He was just there as <laughs> such a cameo. It's like, hi. Like, it, like, I think I remember texting you and being like, it was totally just a, uh, hello, you may know me from Lord of the Rings. Like, <laughs> and now I'm in this film. And it's like, because he literally, like, whatever he says was very, like, he doesn't make any discovery. He doesn't do anything. He just kind of is in the room. When people are discussing discussing what's going so, on, I agree with Rose. <laughs> like, like pretty much. Like it was so unnecessary, but hey, you know, what I mean? he's like, I'll take it. Like, I, you can't blame JJ. It's like, hey, uh, fucking Pippin wants to be a part of the movie. Bring him in. He wasn't right. Pippin. He, he was Mary. Mary. Oh, sorry, I get them mixed up. I know heresy. And he was my favorite character from Lost. And spoiler: the show came out in two thousand four. So if you haven't seen it, bite me. Uh, <laughs> this end, is not the first time you talked about Lost on this show. And, and season three, <laughs> they kill him mm. in the season finale, and it is so heartbreaking. It is more heartbreaking than Kristen Ritter ODing in the bed in Breaking Bad. Oh, God damn. It is heartbreaking. That's another show I need to watch, Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad. Well, spoiler, Kristen Ritter ODs in a bed. Eh. That's Jessica Jones, bro. I'm, oh, Show yeah. some respect. I love Jessica Jones. Yeah, good show, good show. Anyways, that brings us to headline number three. That has nothing to do with Jessica Jones, Star Wars, or anything. Not at all. The Little Season is a buffet of the bizarre. A buffet of the bizarre. This is a book, by the way. This comes to us from RueMorgue.com. It's good to mix things up every now and then. And Bloodbound Books is doing just that with their latest release, The Little Season. The indie imprint, home to some of the most daring, disturbing, and downright grotesque literature ever conjured up by celebrated writers the likes of Christopher Triana, Nikki Knorr, and S.C. Mendes, has created a title so unusual that even some of the diehard fan base isn't sure how to handle it. And that's saying something for a company that's released a body horror coloring book. A body horror coloring book sounds like a fun idea, but really you just need different shades of red. Excellent. The synopsis (laughs) reads, Part splatterpunk, part horror thriller, and totally bizarre, Talon's is a new restaurant looking for food tasters. And Jordan Carter jumped at the chance to join the focus group. However, the qualifying questions embarrassed him. The first appetizer was a stale piece of bread. And worst of all, Jordan felt sick after the meal. When Talon's offers him double the money for a second tasting, he agrees and shrugs off the illness as a coincidence. After the second meal, though, he's convinced something is wrong. Daily nightmares and concerning voices culminate in Jordan vomiting blood. Doctors can find nothing physically wrong with him, and medical tests determine the blood isn't even his. 
Feeling scared and alone, Jordan dives into a rabbit hole of conspiracy theories, astrology, crystal healing, secret societies, and new age science to unravel Talon's ancient secret. In keeping with the culinary and bizarre motif, alongside the book's digital download is a special edition, limited run, cooking bundle, which includes a signed paperback copy, trading card, and apron emblemized with the book's cover art. The cooking bundle can be purchased directly from Bloodbound Books. Yeah, so, you know, we don't cover books a lot, but this seemed like something. Yeah, this seemed like something fun, right? Books are making a comeback. I well, I, do, I really I, I'd like are. to think they haven't gone anywhere, Ryan. I agree. Well, and there's, I know, I know, definitely one of our listeners agrees with you. Hi, hon. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, you know, it's smart because they're giving. It looks like when you buy the the actual physical copy, you get the digital copy, and you know that's honestly that's the way everything goes. Disney does that too, believe it or not, when they release Marvel stuff because yes, Disney owns Marvel. Uh, a lot of times when you buy a single issue comic book, they give you a little code to download it digitally. So you could have like the Marvel app with all your comics digitally on your phone. So same thing. And anyways, I chose uh, to do this story because one, we love Rue Morgue. I have collected the magazines my whole life as well, as long as they've been around. And uh, yeah, I just thought it would be fun to do a creepy horror book. And I haven't read this yet. I mean, it fits right in with our podcast. It fits right in with what we like here. That's creative. It's cool. Yeah. What do you think, though? Like they're eating like people or animals or like what he's eating is like eggs and something's growing in his body because the blood's going to come out when he pukes and it's not his own blood. Is it a different creature's blood? What's happening? Yeah, maybe, I'm interested. I got to read the book. Maybe it's like, yeah, like some kind of like they're using people as incubators for something. That's kind of where my brain went to was a little bit of the alien. Yeah. Especially since this uh, company released a body horror coloring book. It just sounds it looks like they're into body horror. <laughs> yeah. Some grossness, a little bit of gore. But you know what? I fucking love gore. You know, in the movie sense, I do too. But I like creative gore because uh, I was never a fan of the Saw movies very much. Like, I watched them all once, and I liked them for yeah. the story. But I um, I don't like unnecessary g- gory torture, right? So those movies and the Hostel movies didn't really do much for me. But, like, sci-fi, by, like, gore is a little different because it's like, you know, someone turning into a fly, like in The Fly, or someone, you know, getting a weird disease or transforming into something or getting metal like cybernetic implants and it's all gory and gross like that gore makes sense because it informs the narrative whereas it's just like we're gonna rip open this chick's rib cage it's i do love that i do love though those over the top gory films like the old school ones where yeah like the gore was just ridiculous just tearing people over like in half well practical effects with like the 80s movies like i'm gonna chainsaw this person in half those are great those are great what was it dead alive wasn't it that the one movie where like they all turned into crazy zombies and mutated like a mofo and his mom became this like giant zombie monster uh, it is a classic that Dead Alive, I will say. Remember that? I don't think we ever watched that together. We got to watch that sometime. I haven't seen that in years. <laughs> but just uh, make sure you're not carrying a uh, ma- your master sword there, Link. Well, how else are you going to take out a giant zombie if you don't have a six-inch master sword? And that brings <laughs> us to headline number four. Man sentenced to four months in prison for carrying a six-inch master sword in public. This comes to us from IGN.com. A man was sentenced to four months in prison for carrying a six-inch master sword in public, as reported by Eurogamer 48-year-old Anthony Bray of Nuneaton, Nuneaton in Warwickshire, England, was spotted carrying a replica of the iconic weapon from Nintendo's The Legend of Zelda series openly at the town center. Yeah, so, I mean, I get it, right? Because I've bought those before where it's it's basically a knife, but it, it's a small version of a sword from a video game or a movie. I, I don't know. I, I'm seeing the picture. I'd buy it. Yeah, and I mean... I don't know if I'd walk down the street waving it around, though. It's like, man, and that's six inches, bro. That's huge. Well, if you could stab That's with huge. six inches, you're going to die, dude. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Warwickshire police spotted Bray on June 8th via CCTV walking down the street with something in his hand. 
Bray was said to have approached officers with the item visible in his hand, at which point he was arrested as he was carrying a bladed article. To be fair, if you walk towards the cops with a knife in the United States, you're going to get shot. So maybe being arrested ain't so bad. Yeah, because they're just like, stop that. Stop that. Get over here. Not that off. Bray subsequently claimed. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan clearly has never been to England. I have never. Nope. Not once. <laughs> Bray subsequently claimed the Master Sword was a fidget, something to keep his hands busy, that he had bought online. But police said that because it was sharply pointed item, it could be used as a weapon and put others in fear of it being used against them. The police said the Master Sword was inside a sheet that could be released with the press of a button. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it actually sounds like a really cool thing. Despite admitting that the Master Sword could be perceived as threatening if somebody else saw it, Bray insisted during his interview that he would not have used it as a weapon, the police said. Oh, come on. I'm not going to stab anybody. I just want to, like, you know, be like Peter Pan running around with a little sword. Honestly, his story tracks. If this thing, like, shoots it out, like, I could see just, you know, just... Like, in the other hand, then you put it back in. Yeah, if he just got it, he'd be playing with it. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure he spent a pretty good money on it. Yeah, but he must have been looking suspicious, because if people are like, that guy's got a knife, I think he's going to stab someone. You have to be, like, being more than just fidgeting with it, I guess. It's a different time. Yeah, and I'm sure he was probably, like, like testing out to see if his health was full, because then it shoots out a beam. Okay, so something <laughs> that I always identified as a kid is uh, I watched the Disney Peter Pan, because that Peter Pan and it came out in the 50s. I know it was before I was born, but that was the, what we watched. Anyways, long story short, he fights with a really, really short knife. So as a kid, any like six inch, you know, fake sword or knife to me was just the same. Uh, so I could fight a guy with a big sword with this little knife because that's what they did in Peter Pan. The only reason why I bring that up is because this guy's in England. And he's sitting there with his little sword, and maybe he's just a big Peter Pan fan. It was just like, oh, God, ha-ha, I'll get you, Hook. You'll never be, well, I don't know Hook's motivation. What was, what was, what the fuck was Hook's motivation? He just want to kill kids? Like, what was he think? What was his point? I, I think he was just a bad guy. And... Yeah, but, like, did he want to rule Neverland? Like, did he, what? I think so. I, I know we're off topic, because this is a guy who got arrested for a little sword from Zelda. But now that I think about it, what was the point? He was just pissed off? What was his plan after? What if he killed the kid? He killed Peter Pan. He's done. What now? Uh, I honestly <laughs> think that after he did that, he'd probably take over. Because, like, yeah, didn't he want to mess with the mermaids? There were still Indians and mermaids. It's not like the, the whole of Neverland would be his because this 12-year-old's dead. Right. And where's his plunder? <laughs> like, you're stuck. It, it, you're right. It, you're raising a lot of questions, Joe, that I wasn't ready for. I know. And you know what? Fuck it. You're right, dude. Like, what was his problem? I don't know. Like, like he must just be pissed, because, right, like I said, there's no plunder. Like, what are you going to do? And then the moment that fucking Peter Pan takes over your boat, he makes that fucker fly? Like, you suck. Like, uh... like yeah, he, here goes Peter. If Peter was in bad shit, he could go and plunder freaking everything. He's got a flying freaking ghost ship. Oh, man. Maybe that is the Jolly Roger. <gasps> yeah. We're connecting universes here, Ryan. It happened. There you go. And that, uh, but no, seriously, like, was was Captain Hook hanging out in the Caribbean? Was he a Caribbean pirate and just went? I to believe the, so. Because he because going into the Bermuda Triangle might be where he got to Neverland. I'm just saying. Mm. Sure, we could follow a star onward till morning, the first star to the right, whatever it is. Sure, but that's good for happy thoughts. But how did he get there? He didn't fly. And they were probably already all mad from scurvy and shit by the time they got there. And so now they're, like, stuck in a place where they don't age, so they're just perpetually, like, freaking out. I always like the story where Peter Pan and uh, Captain Hook were friends, and they were kids together, and then, like, for some reason, Captain Hook aged because he went back to the real world. That makes sense. There's a few movies that did that. I actually have heard that as well. Yeah. Anyways, you shouldn't <laughs> wave a knife around in England. Yes, it's not a good idea. He no! Was, he was sentenced on June 28th and given a four-month prison sentence. That seems extreme. It really honestly does. I always... Fucking Peter Pan and this dude. Don't make sense. It don't make no <laughs> damn sense. He, and he has to pay a victim surcharge of 154 euro, which is about 200 bucks, American. Sergeant Spellman of the Patrol Investigations Unit commented, we take a zero tolerance to bladed articles in public. And Bray has fallen afoul of this. Knock, knock. 
Who's there? Fuck that. A foul. A foul. <laughs> a foul you. <laughs> a murder most foul is what they were trying to avoid. So, yes, maybe avoid carrying around your six inch. Six inch blade. Yeah. Probably so anywhere. That was very loosely connected to entertainment news because uh, it, it, he had a blade based on a video game. But I thought it was funny and I wanted to discuss it. And it got us on a weird roller coaster to the left. So I think it was worth it. Yes. Anyways. Totally worth it. <laughs> Headline number five. Joe said he's really into this one. I honestly haven't heard of it. Super into it. Okay. <laughs> number five. Chopper five. Chopper five. All right. So headline number five. Horizon Zero Dawn TV series no longer moving forward at Netflix. Which Report. It makes me really sad, actually. This comes to us from IGN.com. According to a report on the alleged toxic, bullying, manipulative, and retaliatory behavior of the Umbrella Academy showrunner Steve Blackman, the Horizon Zero Dawn TV series is seemingly not moving forward on Netflix. And I want to say that sucks. The guy behind the show has had some controversy. And because of that, a great intellectual property is not going to happen. And I was a little worried because Netflix, let's be honest, Netflix cancels shows very quickly. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of other reasons why I'm not a huge fan of Netflix. But they talked about uh, Sadie Sink playing Aloy because the character of Aloy in, is the protagonist in Horizon Zero Dawn, Far and out. she is a redhead in her early 20s, and that would be perfect for Sadie Sink, and Netflix likes to use their same actresses. And that was the last thing I heard. And now this, it's not going to happen. I I'll talk more, but the article itself is going to say some stuff, so I will talk when we're done. I was going to say, we tend to get ahead of it. I know, I know. I just, I really like this game series. <sighs> there are two games in the series, and I believe there's going to be one more. It's from Guerrilla Games. It's a PlayStation exclusive. That's probably why you haven't heard of it. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm a PlayStation man. That's true. I am not. As reported by Rolling Stone, 12 staffers and a HR complaint have detailed the hostile workplace that was said to have been fostered by Blackman. Steve Blackman, you son of a bitch! Sounds like a dick. Although the showrunner has said these claims are entirely untrue and completely absurd. At the end of the yeah, report. To be fair, most people who are accused of stuff say that. Like, yeah. just once I want to hear someone be like, that's right, I am a dick. Like, <laughs> that's right, I, I finally said it, and I'll say it again. It's like, I totally <laughs> fired that person because of their race or gender or sexual preference. Ha ha, I am an ass. It's like, yeah, if you're going to be that much of a douche nozzle, you might as well admit it, right? Like, you got nothing else. <laughs> At the end of the report, it is stated that Blackman was offered an overall development deal reportedly worth $50 million at Netflix in 2020. And the Horizon Zero Dawn series was part of that package alongside an original outer space thriller series called Orbital. Which I'm sure would have been good, but, you know. Me. Now, however, Rolling Stone has learned that the two projects are no longer moving forward per a representative for Blackman, the showrunner has a long, ongoing, and close working relationship with Netflix and continues to work on new projects. Furthermore, Blackman signed a new multi-year deal earlier this year. So long story short, he has a contract where he's still going to work for Netflix, so they can't fire him, but they're not moving forward with any of these high-concept expensive series. And to fulfill the contract, they'll probably throw him a bone and give him some smaller not cost so much money series like i feel like it's like an office move just like we fixed the glitch well it's <laughs> it's kind of like when uh there was a show called um silicon valley a lot of i don't know if you saw it or not but there's a character named big head and he is not very good at his job so they basically put him in a nothing like under contract he has to still work for the company but he has nothing to do he's unassigned so he's just kind of walking around doing nothing and they're just like i get paid so much money and what do you do i don't know he just becomes the copy man just hey joey joe rama make us some copies dude that's an old <laughs> reference even for you <laughs> That is early 90s reference right there. That's Rob Schneider on SNL reference right there. Right, that's right. Making I'm taking a bow, copies. people. Making some copies. All right. For the record, we're not that old. I'm surprised you knew that. 
The Horizon Netflix series was revealed back in 2022 with Blackman as the showrunner, and it was going to star Alloy. Aloy. Aloy. Alloy, Aloy, whatever. <laughs> Horizon Zero Dawn is an exceptionally well-crafted game with wonderful characters not often seen in the rank and file of the gaming world. Blackman said at the time, uh, Gorilla Games. Gorilla Games. Gorilla Games has created an incredibly lush and vivid world of man and machine who find themselves on a collision course to oblivion. Their salvation comes in the form of a young female warrior named Aloy. Aloy. I don't know why I want to say Alloy. Aloy, who has no idea she's the key to saving the world, added Blackman. Suffice it to say, yes. Aloy will be a main character in our story. My writing partner on this, Michelle Labretta, and I are thrilled to be able to expand this remarkable IP into a series for all types of viewers. Sony said back in January 2024 that writing had begun on the series, but we haven't really learned anything else since. All right, so I'm going to spoil kind of the story of the games here. Uh, so if you guys plan on playing the game i don't i'm not sure who's listening but if you plan on playing horizon zero dawn or the sequel uh horizon forbidden west i guess stop listening now after this is the end of the show so see ya. but ah. anyways <laughs> so basically it takes place in the far future ryan the okay far, how far the far future like thousands of years an undetermined amount of time that's pretty far so let's say that in the history of the game Right? Yes. Takes place about like 100 years from now. So it's like, let's say 2070s or something. Okay. Global warming is a problem. A lot of things are a problem. The things mm -hmm. you would consider be a problem are a problem. Mm -hmm. But a company, a big greedy company, makes a basically machine as military, you know, like military machines surprise, that surprise. run off biofuel. And when they need it, they can release little probes that would like, like hypothetically eat a tree and give them fuel to keep going. But he made them hmm. so, but they made themselves aware and they reproduced and they basically destroyed the entire world. Now, when I'm saying destroyed the entire world, I'm saying every living thing, every organic thing was destroyed, eaten by these machines. Dang. And this is in the pre the history of the game. All right. So a uh, person named Elizabeth Sobeck was trying to solve this problem as we're in the apocalypse, as, as it's all falling apart. And she decides that there's no way to stop these machines. So instead, she's going to create a thing called Gaia, and it basically is going to re-terraform the Earth. So a thousand years later, after these machines die out because they need biofuel bio to keep running, That's what's up. they will reintroduce animals and plants and basically recreate the planet. And it had a lot of systems like educating humans and breeding humans and basically re-releasing people so we don't have to be cavemen. They would, you know, learn an underground facility and then be released and blah, 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 blah. Remind well, our listeners what you're talking about. We are talking about a video game series called Horizon Zero Dawn and its sequel, Horizon Forbidden West. Thank you. Thank you. So long story short, because I know I'm. it's a very long-winded big story. So things go wrong and... The humans are created. The the re the terraforming machine works, uh, but people come out like cavemen. They don't know much, so they're just living in a world with no idea of their history. And the terraforming <laughs> process, because it's a video game, uses robotic creatures and dinosaurs to do things. So giant. Thunderbirds would be flying there to clean the air. Giant crocodile robots would swim in the waters to clean the waters. I like these, that. These robots basically were part of the terraforming process. So now we have cavemen type people and your video game setting where you're running around fighting giant robot dinosaurs well, and other damn. things like that. Yeah, right? Uh, now you have to fight them. Now, the, our main character, Alo Aloy, is a, a reincarnation through cloning of Elizabeth Sobeck, the woman who created the AI uh, that would re-terraform the Earth. And that is this beginning and setting of this game. So you're in kind of like a post-apocalyptic far future, but yet humans are like cavemen fighting dinosaur robots, and it turns out in the second game, 
that some people survived the apocalypse by going to a different planet. And it's basically Jeff Bezos' character because <laughs> it's all the rich assholes, and they come back and they're like, "We're gonna retry, we're gonna, we're gonna redo this planet. We're gonna kill all the caveman people." There's a lot going on. It's Jeffrey, but Jeffrey this Bezos. this is such a good game, and it's such a good story, and it talks, it it, it plays with the idea of pre-Diluvian societies in the future, where our society is the pre-Diluvian society. You know what I mean? Oh, we were left behind. I believe that we are a prison planet. I'm just saying, it plays with all that stuff. Because us. imagine in the story, in the world of the game, you are us, and we're looking at the past of like ancient Egypt and stuff, and the Atlanteans, and we're looking at that as like this this weird world that we don't know anything about that like <gasps> could have existed that hundreds of years ago. But that in this game is our world. Oh my god. It's so good. And Sadie Sink, like I said, from Stranger Things, was set to, uh, rumored, rumored, I should say, to play Aloy. Um, The only, uh, it's just, it's such a good game series, and it would have been such a good show, even if, even, oh, excuse me, (laughs) even if they cut it short. Yeah, that sucks, man. I'm sorry. Because, yeah, like, I I honestly am hearing this for the first time, and uh, if there's anybody who's listening that, that are hearing it for the first time, too, like, man, doesn't that, like, that I sounds got, sweet. I got way into this game. That sounds man. sweet. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, Lance, well, Lance hope- Reddick played a great part in it. He was the uh, the the very tall African American gentleman who's skinny. He was in uh, J- he was played Broyles in Fringe, and he was in the John Wex series as the con- the guy who ran the hotel. Anyways, the point. Oh is- yes, yes, I know him in John Wick. Excellent. He died unfortunately, oh, that's and right. uh, so he Fuck. played a main character in the first two games. That's crazy. So I don't know what they're going to do in the third game, you know? Mm. Well, and and even, you know, maybe with this being canceled, a lot of fan films lately have been really good. Like, when it comes to a lot of different franchises, who knows? So you think, well, dude, the problem is making uh, cavemen people fighting robot dinosaurs is not something very many people can afford to do. So I don't know how many fan robot films. Robot dinosaurs. I don't know how many fan films we're going to be. Well, it's not just robot dinosaurs, but some of them are pretty much dinosaurs. It You got to check it out. There's like giraffe things called long necks. Okay. Well. Yeah, there's a big thing. All right, guys. Get the crew so... working on the long necks. <laughs> uh, that'll be it. That's the end of our show. <laughs> More long necks. More long necks. Longer. Longer. <laughs> With a saucer head. Play that video game. Us as a head. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us for this week's episode of Earthling Entertainment. Remember, the best way to support the show is downloading the episode. We don't care where you listen to the episode. Wherever it is, download it. Give us them downloads, because for some reason, that is the best way to support us right now. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to share us with a friend. Do it. Show them and be like, dude, it's a local podcast. They are awesome. We don't even care if you're local to where we record this. If you are in France, you tell them it's a local podcast. They're going to be like, these are clearly dumb Americans. That's, right. That's fine. That's right. And they it's will be part like- of the mystery. Yes. <laughs> so just share it wherever you are. Be like, check them out. If you like spooky stuff, you like UFOs and you like entertainment, everybody does. So listen to us, share it, download it. We love you. Thank you. If you do the Facebook thing, then follow us on Facebook. If you do the Instagram thing, follow us on Instagram. If you do the TikTok thing, follow us on TikTok. If you do the Twitter slash X thing, uh, don't actually. We Go ahead and follow we're, us. We're I'm, having trouble with Twitter I, and X. For, for some reason, <laughs> Elon doesn't want me to sign in. Damn you, Elon. And it's still there. So we're going to figure it out. So actually, yes, follow us there. That way I can be like, see? If you see us on the street, don't follow us. I'm already paranoid about that. Yeah. From all of us here at Earthling Entertainment. From all of us. For you. Goodbye.